I spoke earlier to the Environment Secretary George Eustace and I began by asking him why, if Emmanuel Macron has decided to go for what is a tough national measure, we, he, he doesn't think, and the Prime Minister doesn't think, we need something like that here in the UK. Well, look, every country's got its own challenges dealing with this virus and having to respond in different ways. Uh, I think we are taking it seriously. Uh, we introduced new measures a couple of weeks ago with the new uh, rule of six, uh, tougher restrictions on wearing face masks, for instance, the curfew on pubs. And, um, you know, this week we've gone further, announcing uh, the three alert levels uh, with a, a level three high, very high risk uh, one, meaning there's actually, um, you know, some closures of those um, venues as well. And we're working with local authorities in those areas and mayors to, to work out what additional measures might be needed. But there is a view in your party, and indeed one has sort of heard this from the Prime Minister, that there's some kind of trade-off between what's good for the economy and what's good for health. But if you look at the measures that have been taken in some parts of the world, the places where they've been toughest, actually the economy has recovered fastest. So we're not bearing down hard enough, are we? Well, I think we did. We're taking the right response at the right time. And um, we did a full lockdown, obviously, uh, last spring to try to get this virus under control. We've learnt a lot about it over the last nine months and how um, the, the transmission occurs. And I think we're taking a proportionate approach now. I mean, one of the most striking things earlier this week was hearing the chief medical officer, Chris Whitty, saying that your highest tier of measures are simply not enough. Well, that's why we're working with mayors and other local authorities in those areas to agree with them other measures that will be appropriate. You know, they've all got views as well on this and they've all got to uh, work with us to strike that balance between the impacts on the economy and the need to bear down on this virus. And I think it's important that they are involved with it. So, so no, we and, I, and, I, and I'm very much on that point. I mean, we're hearing tonight that there will be an announcement that Manchester goes into the highest level of risk tomorrow. Well, I'm not aware of that. I, I am aware of the speculation that the uh, Gold Command Group, which is an advisory group um, within the Joint Biosecurity uh, unit have been discussing the situation in Manchester with uh, leaders there. Um, you know, when a uh, decision and if a decision is to be made on Manchester, obviously it'll be made uh, by the uh, Prime Minister and the COVID subcommittee taking into account that advice. Now, Jeremy Hunt, uh, you know, one of your colleagues who knows a thing or two about the health service, former health secretary, said to me that he would support a time-limited lockdown, a so-called circuit breaker. So... Why doesn't the Prime Minister just get on and announce one? Well, look, the Prime Minister's clear that we don't rule anything out because this is a rapidly developing situation and we need to keep all things under review. But, you know, it's important to note that a couple of weeks ago when uh, this was mooted by SAGE, alongside a number of other interventions as well, they did express actually some doubt about how effective a short-term lockdown would be because we know what a long-term lockdown did to the R rate. It got it significantly below uh, one, but it um, so was something we had to endure for several months. And um, they expressed some doubt about what the impact of a two to three week um, mini lockdown would be, um, particularly in the winter months as we're into now, uh, unlike uh, the one last time that occurred in the spring. It's quite difficult to judge the impact of that. And the impacts on the economy would be uh, known, would be highly significant but the impact in terms of arresting the spread of the disease was less certain. So we judged at that point that it wasn't the right thing to do, to go for this circuit breaker, that the right thing to do uh, was the but rule of six. But you are sort of saying it might be the right thing now, because, I mean, let's be clear, since you announced the rule of six, infections have gone up and up and up. We're almost at 20,000 today. Yes, and that's where we're heading into uh, the winter with shorter days, colder weather, which is more conducive to the spread of this virus. It's very clear from the experience uh, in Southern Hemisphere countries as well, who experienced the worst impacts over the summer for them in the months of July. Very clear that there's a, uh, a strong seasonal dimension to the dynamics of this virus. Um, but look, we took a judgment at the time, and I think it was the right judgment to have a proportionate approach to tackle... Uh, this virus by um, taking tougher measures in some of those northern cities where it was getting out of control, but to be more proportionate in parts of the country, uh, like mine in Cornwall, actually, where actually the infection rate remains very low and there's no need 
whatsoever to go do but, a more draconian character. Uh, uh, look, can I just ask you, you talk about the uncertainties around this. Most people can't understand why the Prime Minister thinks that this is a virus that spreads in pubs but doesn't spread in restaurants. Why are restaurants exempted? It just seems counterintuitive. Some people would say bonkers. Well, I think uh, it's because in um, you know, many parts of the country, the culture of drinking mm. around pubs is different to that uh, in restaurants. And now, granted... But why that culture which... simply switch to restaurants? People, people want to go and have a drink, they'll go to a restaurant. Well, I, I think there is a, a particular problem uh, in uh, pubs, in particular, if people are not having food, they're less likely to stay uh, sitting down in one place, uh, much more um, uh, likely to, to, you know, to have a, a night out on the town, drink more, and therefore be less inhibited and less likely to observe the social distancing rules. Um, Ed Conway of Sky has come up with some documents that show within Test and Trace, which I think we all accept isn't working quite as one would like, uh, individual management consultants are charging Test and Trace in a week, what a nurse earns in a year. Most people would say, that's just wrong. Well, look, I'm, I'm not aware of that particular uh, news story, so I've not seen that. But, look, I can understand why people would uh, think that's wrong and, obviously, the government uh, is always trying to bear down on consultants' costs. But look at what we've done with Test and Trace. Yes, it's, um, it's not perfect. We're trying to increase capacity each and every day. But from a standing start... Uh, we've now stood up um, a huge testing and tracing system. We've tested now around 25 million people. Uh, the test and trace system has contacted around 700,000 people. Uh, they're now successful in contacting around 80% of people that they need to uh, in order to advise them and require them to uh, self-isolate and stay at home. Now, look, one final question. This is very much in your patch. I talk to farmers quite a lot. They are deeply worried that when we are fully out of the EU, that you will allow imports of foods and foodstuffs from countries where animal welfare standards are below our animal welfare standards. It's all they want to talk to me about. Why won't you at least accept their advice to you, which is to set up a commission to look at this? Well, we have set up just such a commission, the Trade and Agriculture Commission. It's what the... NFU asked for. Um, the NFU suggested that Tim Smith, who's a former uh, chairman of the FSA, should chair that commission. So we accepted that and made him the chair. Um, since then, the NFU have said they'd like it placed on a statutory footing. And that's right. We don't think that's necessary to put it on a statutory footing. We've got a manifesto commitment. We have all of the powers we need to prevent lower standard foods entering this country, both through the uh, the food safety chapter that uh, is in any free trade agreement. But why not just legislate to ban standards of food, or, or rather to ban food from countries which don't follow our standards? Why not just legislate? Well, we do have such legislation. We have a prohibition on the sale uh, of meats treated with hormones, and we have a prohibition on the sale but on the use of don't uh, have chlorine. But, but, but farmers don't have confidence in the prohibitions. that They want more. Well, I, in terms of those two, it's a prohibition on sale, so it is, it is literally not possible for someone to sell hormone-treated beef in this country. What farmers really want, and the, the issue that I understand, is they don't want to be exposed to competition from countries that have lower animal welfare standards. That's right. And we understand that, and that is why uh, we've been very clear we will use tariff policy in order to prevent... Uh, imports coming in from countries with lower animal welfare standards. Well, all I can say is the farmers know that and they're not happy, but uh, we'll pick up with, with, on all of that with you again at another point. Thank you so, uh, thank thank you so much for joining.